Welcome to Bible Stories. Today, we are about to embark on an extraordinary journey through one of the most influential and profound letters ever written, the Book of Romans. Whether you're a seasoned believer or someone seeking to understand the depths of Christian faith, this exploration is for you. The city of Rome, at the heart of the mighty Roman Empire, was more than just a political and cultural center. It was a place where ideas and beliefs clashed and converged. It was here, in the midst of a world dominated by power and paganism, that the early Christian church began to grow and thrive. But how did these early Christians, many of whom were facing persecution and living in a city steeped in emperor worship, find the strength to spread the gospel? The answer lies in a letter Paul's letter to the Romans. This letter was not just a message to the church in Rome. It was a theological masterpiece that would shape the course of Christian history. Through this letter, Paul sought to unify a diverse group of believers, offering them a clear and powerful explanation of the gospel that would resonate across the ages. As we dive into the rich history and deep theological truths of the Book of Romans, you'll discover why this letter has been a cornerstone of Christian faith for centuries. We'll explore the challenges faced by the early church, the profound teachings of Paul, and the enduring impact of Romans on both the church and the world. But before we dive into this fascinating history, I want to take a moment to invite you to join our community here at Bible Stories. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be the first to know when we release new videos that delve into the depths of Scripture. And if you find this video insightful, don't forget to leave a like, share it with your church group family and friends, and leave a comment below. Welcome to Roman Stories, where we journey through the fascinating history and profound impact of one of the most significant letters ever written. The Book of Romans. As we dive into the heart of the Roman Empire, the very center of ancient power, culture, and religion, we uncover how this remarkable letter, penned by the Apostle Paul, challenged the very foundations of the world as it was known. The city of Rome, a symbol of dominance and grandeur, became the unlikely stage for a spiritual revolution that would echo through the centuries. In this video, we will explore the depths of Paul's teachings, the transformative power of the gospel, and how the message of Romans continues to shape the course of history and our lives today. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you to become part of our community here at Roman Stories. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel. By doing so, you'll stay up to date with our latest explorations into the rich history of Rome and the stories that have shaped our world. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you find it insightful and share your thoughts in the comments below. We love hearing from you. And of course, share this video with your community group, family and friends, so they too can join us on this incredible journey through the heart of history. In the expansive reach of the Roman Empire, the city of Rome emerged as the epicenter of the ancient world, where power, culture and religion converged. It was the heartbeat of an empire that spanned the Mediterranean basin, exerting control over lands and peoples through a combination of military strength and efficient governance. At its zenith, the Roman Empire presented both opportunities and challenges to those living under its dominion. For early Christians, Rome was not just the center of worldly power, but also the most significant spiritual battleground. While the empire thrived, it also grappled with social and political tensions, with stark inequality marking daily life, where the wealthy lived in opulence and the poor in hardship. 
Pagan religions dominated spiritual practices, with temples and cults dedicated to various gods scattered throughout the city. Yet despite these grand rituals, a spiritual emptiness persisted for many, a yearning for something more profound that the existing religions could not satisfy. It was in this bustling and diverse environment that Christianity began to take root. For many, the emerging Christian faith offered hope that the ancient world had not provided the promise of eternal life and a direct connection with God. The early church, comprised of both Jewish converts and Gentiles, began to flourish within this diverse and often hostile culture. Rome, with its global influence, became a pivotal location for spreading the gospel. The city that ruled the known world was on the brink of becoming the stage for a spiritual revolution. The message of the gospel, which had originated in distant lands, was about to challenge the heart of paganism and alter the course of history. This was the context in which Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, a message intended to fortify the faith of a church situated at the very center of worldly power. The church in Rome was not established by Paul, but by anonymous Christians who had arrived in the city, perhaps among Jews returning from festivals in Jerusalem or missionaries inspired by the events of Pentecost. These early believers formed a vibrant community in the heart of the empire, uniting Jews and Gentiles under the banner of Christ. The church's rapid growth was driven by its diversity and the believers' fervent desire to share the good news, despite facing considerable challenges such as persecution and discrimination. Rome, with its mix of cultures, presented both opportunities and obstacles. Christians in the city had to navigate a landscape where emperor worship was commonplace, and any threat to the established order was swiftly suppressed. Yet the church remained resilient, upheld by its steadfast faith and its message of love and salvation. The coexistence of Jews and Gentiles within the same Christian community also brought about theological and practical challenges. Differences in religious and cultural practices had to be reconciled in light of the gospel. Achieving unity and diversity was a difficult but essential goal for the church's witness. It was within this complex environment that Paul wrote his letter aiming to strengthen the community and guide it in matters of faith and practice. Rome was more than just a city. It symbolized a new era for Christianity. The foundation of the church in Rome marked the beginning of a transformation that would eventually reach every corner of the empire. Paul's letter to the Romans would become a key instrument in this process, shaping Christian thought and defining the church's mission in a vast and diverse world. Paul of Tarsus, born Saul, was a man with a complex past and a profound mission. A Jew by birth and a Roman citizen, he was well versed in Jewish scriptures and traditions, having been educated under the respected Rabbi Gamaliel. Initially, Paul was a zealous persecutor of Christians, viewing the movement as a heresy that needed to be eradicated. His zeal was so fervent that he actively participated in the persecution of early believers, seeking to destroy them in the name of his faith. However, everything changed dramatically on the road to Damascus, where Paul experienced a transformative encounter with the risen Christ. This event not only altered the course of his life, but also the trajectory of Christian history. Paul's conversion marked the beginning of his journey as Christianity's most passionate missionary and theologian. From a persecutor, Paul became an unwavering defender of the faith, traveling throughout the Mediterranean world to preach the gospel and establish churches. He was a man of contrasts, combining a sharp intellect and rigorous education with an intense passion for Christ and the gospel. 
His letters, including the letter to the Romans, are profound and theologically rich, reflecting his ability to articulate the mysteries of faith with clarity and accessibility. Paul had a unique understanding of grace and faith, based on his own experience of being saved, not by works, but by God's grace. The letter to the Romans is considered one of his masterpieces, where he systematically expounds on the doctrine of salvation by faith. Paul, once the church's fiercest opponent, now dedicated his life to strengthening and expanding the body of Christ. His personal story of redemption became a powerful testament to what God can accomplish in anyone's life, no matter how far they may seem from salvation. The letter to the Romans is often regarded as the most significant of Paul's epistles, not only for its theological depth, but also for its lasting impact on Christian history. Likely written during Paul's third missionary journey while he was in Corinth, the letter aimed to pave the way for his visit to Rome. Paul longed to meet the Christian community in Rome personally and to bolster their faith with his teachings. What sets the letter to the Romans apart is how it systematically and thoroughly articulates the central doctrines of the Christian faith. Paul addresses themes such as justification by faith, the role of the law, the nature of sin, God's grace, salvation for both Jews and Gentiles, and life in the Spirit. Each of these themes is explored with a depth that challenges readers to reflect on the core of their faith. Beyond its theological significance, the letter to the Romans has had a profound impact on the history of Christian thought. Over the centuries, theologians like Augustine, Luther and Wesley have been deeply influenced by this epistle and their interpretations have shaped the course of Western Christianity. The power and clarity of Paul's message have resonated through the ages, inspiring spiritual renewals and reform movements in various periods. For the early Christians, the letter was a source of encouragement and guidance. For us today, it remains a vital document that helps us understand the depth and beauty of the gospel. The importance of the letter to the Romans lies not only in its content, but also in its ability to continue speaking to the hearts and minds of believers across all ages. From the very first lines of the letter, it is clear that Paul is delivering a message of hope and salvation to all who believe. He begins by exalting the gospel as the power of God, for the salvation of everyone who believes. This declaration serves as the foundation upon which the entire letter is built, a bold proclamation that salvation is not a human achievement, but a gift from God, accessible to all, both Jews and Gentiles. The hope that Paul offers is both personal and universal. For the individual, it is the hope of redemption, of a new life in Christ free from the dominion of sin and death. For humanity as a whole, it is the promise of ultimate reconciliation with God, a return to the original purpose of creation. This hope is sustained by faith, an unwavering trust in God's power to fulfill His promises. Salvation, as Paul describes it, is a process that begins with justification by faith and culminates in glorification when believers will be fully transformed into the image of Christ. Between these two extremes lies sanctification, a continuous process of transformation and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Paul makes it clear that this salvation is total and comprehensive, affecting every area of the believer's life. Ultimately, the letter to the Romans is a message of victory, Christ's victory, over sin, death, and the forces of evil. It is a letter that asserts that regardless of circumstances, believers can be assured of their salvation and of God's faithfulness. 
This assurance brings an indestructible hope that sustains the believer through life's difficulties and prepares them for the future glory that will be revealed. The gospel, as described by Paul in his letter to the Romans, is not just a message of good news, it is the very power of God in action. From the outset, Paul makes it clear that the gospel possesses a transformative force capable of altering the course of life for those who receive it. For Paul, this message of salvation goes beyond mere words. It is dynamic, living and effective, capable of changing destinies and spiritual realities. Paul emphasizes that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes without distinction between Jew and Gentile. This was revolutionary at the time as it broke down deeply entrenched cultural and religious barriers. The power of the gospel, according to Paul, lies precisely in its ability to reach and transform anyone, regardless of their background or status. It is a universal message intended for all people and nations. In addition to its universality, the gospel is also the revelation of God's righteousness in Christ. God reveals His righteousness not as a human virtue, but as a divine gift given to those who believe. This righteousness is not achieved through works or the law, but is credited to believers by faith. The power of the gospel, therefore, not only transforms lives, but also establishes a new relationship between God and humanity, based on grace and faith. This transformative power of the gospel is what drove Paul in his tireless mission to preach Christ to all corners of the Roman Empire. He knew that the gospel had the power to liberate, heal, and restore, and that is why he devoted his life to this cause. To Paul, the gospel was the driving force behind the world, the manifestation of God's power in its fullest form. At the core of his letter to the Romans lies the doctrine of justification by faith, a principle that is central not only to Paul's teachings, but to all of Christianity. For Paul, justification is not something humans can earn through their own efforts or by adhering to the law. Rather, it is a divine act where God declares sinners righteous based on their faith in Jesus Christ. This groundbreaking idea challenged the traditional Jewish view of the law and ushered in a new phase in the relationship between God and humanity. Justification by faith signifies that salvation is a gift from God, not a reward for good deeds. Paul contends that since all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, no one can achieve justification through the law's works. The only hope for humanity is to place their faith in Christ, who fulfilled the law and bore the penalty for sin on our behalf. This doctrine emphasizes human dependence on God's grace, dispelling any belief that salvation can be earned through personal merit. This message resonated powerfully with Gentiles, who lacked the law as a moral and religious guide. For them, justification by faith meant they could also become part of God's people, not by adopting Jewish customs, but simply by believing in Christ. For Jews, this doctrine required a profound rethinking of their relationship with the law and with God. In both cases, justification by faith offered spiritual freedom, liberating people from the burden of trying to achieve perfection through human effort. The concept of justification by faith also has significant ethical and spiritual implications. It transforms how believers live, knowing they are justified not by their own righteousness, but by the righteousness of Christ. This understanding calls believers to a life of humility, gratitude, and service not as a way to earn God's favor, but as a response to the love He has already demonstrated in Christ. 
One of the most complex issues Paul addresses in his letter to the Romans is the role of the law in a believer's life, particularly in relation to divine grace. For Paul, the law given to Moses by God was holy and just, yet it was powerless to bring salvation. According to Paul, the law served a specific purpose, to reveal sin, acting as a mirror that showed humanity's inability to meet God's standards. The law itself could not save. Its role was to make people aware of their need for a savior. In Romans, Paul argues that the law's function was to prepare the way for grace by highlighting how much everyone needs God's mercy. The law, then, is not opposed to grace, but is part of God's plan to lead people to recognize their total dependence on Him. With the coming of Christ, divine grace was fully revealed. While the law demanded perfection, grace offers forgiveness. Grace is God's unearned favor, freely given to all who believe. For Paul, this grace is not a license to sin, but a force that empowers believers to live holy lives. Grace transforms, liberates, and strengthens believers, enabling them to obey God, not out of fear of punishment, but out of love and gratitude. The challenge for Christians, especially those with a Jewish background, was to reconcile their deep respect for the law with the freedom offered by grace. Paul urges believers to understand that justification comes solely through faith in Christ, not through observing the law. However, this does not render the law irrelevant. Rather, it finds its fulfillment and purpose in Christ. Grace, therefore, does not abolish the law, but completes it in a comprehensive way, allowing believers to live under a new covenant with God. To illustrate his doctrine of justification by faith, Paul refers to the figure of Abraham, the patriarch of Israel. Abraham is presented as the perfect example of faith, for he was justified by his trust in God even before the law was given and long before the practice of circumcision, the sign of the Jewish covenant. In Romans, Paul argues that Abraham was justified not by his works, but by his faith in God's promise. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. For Paul, this demonstrates that justification by faith is not a new doctrine, but a continuation of what God has always done with his people. Abraham is called the father of all who believe because he exemplifies how faith, not works, is the path to righteousness. This was a powerful message, especially for Gentiles, who could see in Abraham a model of faith that transcends Jewish laws and customs. By emphasizing Abraham as the father of faith, Paul also addresses the issue of circumcision. He explains that Abraham was justified before he was circumcised, making him the father of both the circumcised and the uncircumcised. This means that faith, not rituals or works, is what truly matters for being counted as righteous before God. Abraham, therefore, serves as proof that God's promise is for everyone, regardless of their cultural or religious heritage. Abraham's faith is the foundation upon which Paul builds his argument that justification is a gift from God, accessible to all who believe, not just those who follow Jewish traditions. As Paul delves deeper into his message, he explores what it means to live this new life in Christ. Justification by faith is not just a legal change in a believer's status, it marks the beginning of a radical and ongoing transformation. The new life in Christ signifies a break from the past, a death to sin, and a rebirth to a life dedicated to God. For Paul, this transformation is symbolized in baptism, which represents the believer's death and resurrection with Christ. In baptism, the believer is buried with Christ, symbolizing the end of the old life, marked by sin and rebellion against God. 
Rising from the water, the believer is resurrected to a new life characterized by righteousness and communion with God. This new life is no longer lived under the dominion of sin, but under the power of grace. Paul emphasizes that while sin remains a reality, it no longer holds power over those who are in Christ. This new life is also marked by a shift in allegiance. The believer now belongs to Christ, and this belonging entails a new way of living. Paul encourages Christians to consider themselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This means that the Christian life is one of obedience, not out of obligation, but out of gratitude for the redemptive work of Christ. The new life in Christ is therefore a life of freedom and responsibility, where the believer is called to live according to the Spirit and not according to the desires of the flesh. This transformation is an ongoing process that Paul refers to as sanctification, the journey by which the believer living under grace is progressively shaped into the image of Christ. The new life in Christ is both a present reality and a future promise, culminating in glorification when Christ returns. It is a life lived in hope, with eyes fixed on the promise of complete redemption. Even after embracing the new life in Christ, believers still face the harsh reality of sin. Paul candidly addresses this internal struggle, describing it as a constant battle between the flesh and the spirit. Although justified and freed from sin's condemnation, believers still live in a fallen world and inhabit bodies that bear a sinful nature. This conflict can be discouraging, but Paul offers hope by affirming that while sin persists, it no longer rules over those who are in Christ. Paul uses the analogy of slavery to illustrate the believer's condition before knowing Christ. Humans before Christ are enslaved to sin, unable to liberate themselves. However, through faith in Christ, this slavery is broken and the believer is free to serve God. This freedom does not imply that sin disappears. The struggle against sin continues, but now the believer fights from a position of victory, confident that God's grace is sufficient to sustain them. This daily battle requires vigilance and reliance on the Holy Spirit. Paul underscores that it is the Spirit who enables believers to put to death sinful desires and live in obedience to God. Victory over sin is not achieved through human effort, but through continuous submission to God's will and the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. To follow the guidance of the Spirit, believers must consistently choose to live by the Spirit, turning away from the temptations of the flesh. Paul offers reassurance, reminding believers that despite their failures and struggles, they are more than conquerors through Christ. The certainty of salvation and the power of the Spirit provide the strength needed to resist sin and live lives that honor God. Though the battle against sin is real and intense, victory has already been secured by Christ, and this hope sustains believers on their journey of faith. The presence of the Holy Spirit is one of the greatest gifts believers receive when they are united with Christ. In Romans, Paul dedicates an entire chapter to explaining the essential role of the Spirit in the Christian life. The Holy Spirit is not just a guide or helper. He is the guarantee of our salvation and the source of the power needed to live the Christian life. Through the Spirit, believers are transformed, empowered, and guided in their walk with God. Paul contrasts the Spirit who gives life with the flesh, which leads to death. The Holy Spirit renews the minds and hearts of believers, enabling them to live according to God's will. This transformation is both internal and external, as the Spirit shapes the believer's character and produces fruits that reflect the nature of Christ. The presence of the Spirit is a defining mark of those who belong to God. 
and it is through the Spirit that believers are adopted as God's children. The Holy Spirit also plays a crucial role in prayer. Paul explains that in our weaknesses, when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. This means that even in our limitations, the Spirit is present, translating our deepest desires and needs to the Father. This intercession ensures that our prayers, even when imperfect, are heard and answered according to God's will. Additionally, the Holy Spirit gives us the assurance of our future inheritance. He is the deposit that guarantees our redemption, the certainty that one day we will be completely free from sin and dwell forever in God's presence. This assurance provides believers with the strength and perseverance to endure life's hardships, knowing that the Spirit who dwells within them is the promise of future glory. Paul does not shy away from the reality that the Christian life is marked by challenges and sufferings. He himself endured numerous persecutions, deprivations and trials because of his faith, and he understood that the believers in Rome would also face difficulties. In Romans, Paul addresses the issue of suffering, explaining that although it is an inevitable part of the Christian life, it has a redemptive purpose and is part of God's sovereign plan to shape his children. Paul emphasizes that the present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. This eternal perspective is key to understanding the hardships of the Christian life. Believers are called to look beyond their immediate circumstances and focus on God's promises. Suffering, then, is seen as temporary, a pathway through which God works to strengthen faith, purify character, and prepare believers for future glory. Moreover, Paul teaches that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance builds character, which in turn fosters hope. This process of spiritual growth is essential to the Christian life. It is in the fire of trials that faith is refined and Christian character is formed. Believers are encouraged to endure suffering with patience, trusting that God is present in the midst of their tribulations and that He uses all things for the good of those who love Him. Paul also reminds believers that they are not alone in their struggles. The Holy Spirit is with them, sustaining and strengthening them, and the Christian community plays a vital role, offering support, encouragement, and prayer. While the Christian life is difficult, Paul assures believers that they have the necessary spiritual resources to persevere, and that present suffering is shaping them for future glory. Continuing his discussion on suffering, Paul presents a glorious vision of the future that awaits believers. He describes creation as groaning in the pains of childbirth, eagerly awaiting the revelation of the children of God. This powerful image serves as a reminder that the world is not as it should be, but there is hope beyond the current circumstances. The future glory that Paul speaks of is the moment when all creation will be redeemed and renewed, along with the children of God. This promise of future glory is a great source of comfort for believers who face sufferings and trials. Paul highlights that just as Christ suffered and was then glorified, so too will believers who share in his sufferings be glorified. The hope of resurrection and eternal life with Christ is the anchor of the Christian faith. This future glory is not merely an abstract concept. It is a reality that motivates believers to persevere, knowing that their sufferings are not in vain. The expectation of future glory also influences how believers live in the present. Knowing that a new creation is coming, they are called to live in a way that reflects the values of God's kingdom. 
The promise that one day all tears will be wiped away, that there will be no more death, mourning, or pain, gives believers the courage and purpose to endure daily struggles and to remain faithful until the end. Moreover, the future glory is a collective promise that includes not only individuals, but all of creation. Paul reminds us that we are all awaiting the redemption of our bodies, the full adoption as God's children. This communal vision of redemption reminds us that we are all on this journey together, and our hope is not only personal but also cosmic, encompassing the entire universe created by God. One of the most complex and sometimes controversial themes that Paul addresses in the letter to the Romans is the mystery of predestination. He writes that God, in his wisdom and sovereignty, has predestined some to be conformed to the image of his Son. For Paul, this doctrine is a source of great comfort and hope, as it reveals that God has an eternal plan and purpose for those he calls. According to Paul, predestination is the assurance that nothing can separate believers from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He makes it clear that predestination is not based on human merit, but on divine grace. God chooses not because of any merit or prior action, but according to the counsel of His will. This reinforces the message that salvation is entirely the work of God from beginning to end. Predestination, therefore, is a demonstration of God's sovereign love, where He chooses to save those who are lost and unable to save themselves. This mystery, however, raises profound questions about God's justice and goodness, especially regarding those who are not chosen. Paul addresses these concerns by acknowledging that God's ways are beyond human comprehension and that His wisdom surpasses our understanding. He encourages believers to trust in God's goodness and justice even when the details of His plan remain mysterious. For Paul, the mystery of predestination should lead believers to greater humility and gratitude. Knowing that they were chosen by God should inspire them to live in worship and obedience, recognizing that everything they have is a gift of God's grace. The mystery of predestination is not a reason for pride or arrogance, but for deep reverence for the God who has chosen and called believers to be His sons and daughters. One of the most sensitive and theologically complex topics Paul addresses in his letter to the Romans is the issue of Israel and its relationship to salvation. Being a Jew himself, Paul expresses deep sorrow and anguish over the fact that many of his fellow Jews reject Jesus as the Messiah. He begins this theme with a heartfelt declaration that he would be willing to be separated from Christ if it could lead to Israel's salvation, demonstrating how personal and urgent this issue was for him. Paul argues that although Israel has received the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the law, and the promises, many still have not recognized Jesus as the fulfillment of these promises. However, he clarifies that God's word has not failed. Through a series of theological arguments, Paul explains that not all physical descendants of Israel are truly Israel. For him, true Israel consists of those who are children of the promise, not just children of the flesh. This distinction is crucial for understanding God's plan for salvation. Paul argues that God, in his sovereignty, has the right to choose and call whom he wills. This raises questions about God's justice which Paul addresses with the image of the potter and the clay, affirming that God has the right to shape his creation as he pleases. However, Paul also reassures that God has not rejected his people Israel, but that there is a remnant chosen by grace. Ultimately, Paul reveals the mystery that Israel's rejection is not final. He prophesies that in the end all Israel will be saved, 
showing that God's plan includes the eventual restoration of His chosen people. As the full number of Gentiles enters the kingdom of God, Israel's future salvation becomes certain, revealing that God's plan is inclusive and always faithful to His promises in ways that go beyond human comprehension. A central issue in Paul's discussion is the unbelief of many Jews, particularly concerning the gospel. Despite the promises and revelations granted to Israel, many Jews do not accept Jesus as the Messiah. Paul does not shy away from this harsh reality, but seeks to understand it within the context of God's sovereign plan. He suggests that Israel's unbelief allowed the Gentiles to embrace the gospel. Using the metaphor of an olive tree, Paul explains that the natural branches representing the unbelieving Jews were broken off, while the wild olive branches symbolizing the believing Gentiles were grafted in. This imagery demonstrates the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's promise, while also serving as a warning. Just as the natural branches were broken off due to unbelief, the Gentiles could also be removed if they do not remain in faith. However, Paul sees a redemptive purpose even in Israel's temporary unbelief. He argues that the salvation of the Gentiles is intended to provoke Israel to jealousy, leading them back to God. Thus Israel's rejection is not final, but part of a broader plan that will ultimately bring about the reconciliation of all people with God. Paul concludes this reflection with a doxology, praising the depth of God's riches, wisdom, and knowledge. He acknowledges that God's ways are beyond our understanding and that even in the mystery of unbelief and God's plan, the only appropriate response is to worship and trust in His sovereignty. For Paul, although God's plan is complex and sometimes difficult to grasp, it is perfect and will ultimately fulfill His promises. After discussing these profound doctrines of faith and God's sovereign plan, Paul shifts his focus to the practical lives of believers. He begins this section with an urgent plea. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. For Paul, the Christian mind is the battleground where conformity to the world or transformation by God's will is decided. This transformation is not a one-time event, but a continuous process. Paul urges believers to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which he describes as true and proper worship. This means a complete surrender of life, fully submitted to God's will. The transformation of the mind involves rejecting worldly patterns and values, adopting a new way of thinking based on God's revealed truth in Scripture. This renewed mindset enables believers to discern and live out God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul highlights that this transformation of the mind leads to the cultivation of Christian virtues, such as humility, selflessness, and love. He advises believers not to think too highly of themselves, but to have a sober assessment according to the measure of faith God has given each one. This renewed mind is the foundation for life within the Christian community. Paul describes how this new way of thinking should manifest in relationships of love and mutual service within the body of Christ. He envisions a Christian life where spiritual gifts are used for the common good, and each believer contributes to building up the church according to the grace they have received. A transformed mind is essential for living according to God's purpose and experiencing the fullness of life in Christ. Paul continues with an emphasis on love as the essence and fulfillment of the law. He cites the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, stating that love fulfills the entire law. 
For Paul, love is not just one virtue among others, but the central virtue that should guide all actions and attitudes of believers. In a world marked by division and hatred, love is the force that unifies and transforms. The love Paul speaks of is not a superficial emotion, but a deliberate choice to seek the good of others, even at personal cost. This kind of love is the hallmark of a follower of Christ and evidence that the mind has been truly transformed. Paul challenges believers to live in a way that puts love at the center of all their interactions, both within and outside the Christian community. This practical love is demonstrated through concrete actions, avoiding evil, doing good, honoring others, being generous, blessing those who persecute, living in harmony, and seeking peace. For Paul, love is not just a theoretical concept. It must be expressed in acts of kindness, compassion, and service. By loving others, believers fulfill God's law in a way that goes beyond merely following commandments. Paul also connects love to social responsibility, reminding believers that time is short and that salvation is nearer now than when they first believed. With this sense of urgency, he exhorts them to clothe themselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and to avoid gratifying the desires of the flesh. For Paul, love is both a spiritual weapon and a call to action, shaping the lives of believers in a world awaiting Christ's return. Addressing the delicate topic of Christians' relationship with governmental authorities, Paul begins by asserting that all authority is established by God, and therefore believers must submit to it. This instruction might seem surprising, especially given the context of the Roman Empire, which frequently persecuted Christians. However, Paul makes no exceptions, viewing the social order as part of God's plan and believing that submission to authorities is a crucial aspect of the Christian witness. Paul argues that rulers are God's servants, placed in positions of authority to punish evil and reward good. For this reason, he exhorts Christians to obey laws and pay their taxes, not only out of fear of punishment, but also for the sake of conscience. For Paul, submission to authorities is an expression of obedience to God, who is sovereign over all things. However, this submission to authorities is not blind or absolute. A believer's ultimate loyalty is to God, and when human laws conflict with God's law, the believer must obey God above all else. This principle is exemplified by the apostles, who, when ordered to stop preaching the gospel, replied, We must obey God rather than men. Paul recognizes the complexity of this issue, but believes that in most cases, submission to authority is an essential part of the Christian life. He concludes this theme by reminding believers that they owe love to everyone, and this debt is never fully repaid. Even in their relationship with authorities, love should be the guiding principle. Submission to authorities when done with an attitude of love and respect, is not only a civic duty, but also a testimony to the transformation that the gospel brings to believers' lives. This kind of submission reveals the peace and order that God's kingdom brings to the world. When discussing life within the Christian community, Paul emphasizes the importance of tolerance and respect for differences within the church. He acknowledges that the Christian community is made up of people from diverse backgrounds with varying convictions, especially on secondary matters such as dietary practices and the observance of holy days. Paul urges believers not to judge one another over these differences, but to accept one another in love, recognizing that all are servants of the same Lord. He stresses that each person must be fully convinced in their own mind about these issues and act according to their conscience. 
Paul warns against the danger of imposing judgments on fellow believers in areas where scripture is not explicit. The focus should be on mutual edification, seeking what promotes peace and builds up the body of Christ. For Paul, the unity of the church is more important than uniformity of opinions on non-essential matters. This attitude of tolerance does not imply indifference or relativism, but rather a commitment to love that transcends differences. Paul instructs those who are stronger in faith not to despise those who are weaker, but to bear with their weaknesses, avoiding any actions that might cause scandal or harm to others' consciences. This concern for the spiritual well-being of others is an expression of Christian love, seeking the good of neighbors in all circumstances. Paul concludes this discussion with an appeal for unity amid diversity, reminding believers that Christ accepted all both Jews and Gentiles into his family. Gentiles, and they are called to do the same. Embracing differences with love and understanding strengthens the church and serves as a testament to the world of God's inclusive grace. Practicing tolerance and respect mirrors the nature of Christ, who came to serve and sacrifice for many. Unity within the church is a central theme in Paul's teachings, particularly in his letter to the Romans. He envisions the church as the body of Christ, where each member plays a unique and vital role. Paul views the diversity of gifts and functions as a strength, not a cause for division. He emphasizes that unity is not about uniformity but harmony, where different parts work together for the common good. Paul stresses that this unity must be rooted in love and humility, with each member considering others more important than themselves and striving for the well-being of the entire body. Pride, competition and division are contrary to the church's nature, which is meant to reflect the unity found within the Trinity. He exhorts believers to maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, reminding them of their shared foundation, one body, one Spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. This unity is also expressed through the practice of bearing with and forgiving one another. Paul acknowledges that conflicts and misunderstandings are inevitable in a diverse community, but he insists that forgiveness and reconciliation are crucial for preserving unity. The church should be a place where love covers a multitude of sins, and members work together to mend broken relationships. Paul concludes his call for unity by reminding believers of the church's higher purpose to glorify God and serve as a witness to the world. The unity of the church is a powerful tool for evangelism, demonstrating the transformative power of the gospel. When the church lives in unity, it reflects the beauty of God's kingdom and draws others to Christ. Unity is not merely an internal matter, it is a visible testimony to God's love and grace. As Paul nears the end of his letter, he includes a series of personal greetings, a typical feature of his epistles. These greetings provide a window into the network of relationships and the vibrant community among early Christians. Paul mentions more than 30 individuals by name, including men and women, Jews and Gentiles, leaders and servants. This list of greetings highlights the inclusive and diverse nature of the early church. He greets Priscilla and Aquila, his fellow workers in Christ who risked their lives for him, and acknowledges the church that meets in their home, indicating that even in Rome, where Christians were a minority, the church was growing and organizing into house communities. Paul also mentions names like Andronicus, Junia, Tryphena, Tryphosa, and Persis, underscoring the significant role women played in the ministry and life of the church. 
These greetings reveal Paul's personal connection with the Roman church, even though he had not yet visited the city. His deep affection and respect for these believers are evident, and his greetings reflect a genuine desire to strengthen the bonds of fellowship and love. Paul commends the hard work and faithfulness of these individuals, showing that ministry is not the work of a single person, but of a community of committed believers. His final greetings also serve as a reminder that the church is a family where each member is known and cherished. Including these names in the letter underscores the importance of every individual in God's work. No one is insignificant and each believer has a role to play in the body of Christ. Paul's greetings close the letter on a personal and warm note highlighting the unity and diversity of the church. The letter to the Romans has left an indelible mark on the history of the church. From the early days of Christianity, it was recognized as one of the most comprehensive and systematic presentations of Christian theology. The depth and clarity with which Paul addresses topics such as justification by faith, grace, the law, and the sovereignty of God have made Romans one of the most studied, commented upon, and revered texts of Scripture. The influence of Romans can be seen in the lives and work of great theologians and reformers throughout history. Augustine of Hippo, Martin Luther, and John Wesley, among others, were profoundly impacted by the message of Romans, leading them to initiate movements of renewal and reformation within the church. Paul's emphasis on God's grace and justification by faith became the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation, which reshaped Western Christianity. Beyond its theological impact, the letter to the Romans has also profoundly affected the practical lives of believers. Its teachings on life in the spirit, sanctification, and the renewal of the mind have guided generations of Christians in their daily walk with God. The message of Romans is timeless, speaking to both early Christians and modern believers, challenging them to live according to the truth of the gospel. The legacy of Romans is ultimately a testament to the transformative power of God's word. This letter continues to inspire, encourage, and instruct all who seek to know God more deeply and live lives that glorify Him. Its central message, salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, remains at the heart of Christian faith, guiding the church in its mission to proclaim the gospel to the world. As we reflect on the history and message of the Book of Romans, it is impossible to overlook the enduring influence this letter has had and continues to have on the church and the world. Romans is not merely a historical document, it is a living letter that speaks powerfully to each generation. Its influence extends beyond theology and into the everyday lives of believers who find in Paul's message a call to faith, hope, and action. The impact of Romans transcends cultures, eras, and contexts. In times of persecution, Christians have drawn courage and resilience from its words. In times of peace, Romans has served as a guide for ethical and spiritual living. In times of theological confusion, it has provided a firm anchor, keeping the church grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This letter has been, and continues to be, a beacon that illuminates the path of faith. Moreover, Romans has played a crucial role in shaping Christian thought on issues such as social justice, morality, and the role of believers in society. Paul's emphasis on love, humility, and civic responsibility has inspired movements of social reform and positive change around the world. The letter to the Romans has not only shaped the church, it has also influenced the very course of Western civilization. The enduring impact of Romans is a testament to the power of God's Word. 
As the church continues to study, preach, and live out the message of this letter, its legacy will only grow. Romans calls us to a living faith, a secure hope, and an active love virtues that, when practiced, have the power to transform lives, communities, and the world. The story of Romans is not just the story of a book. It is the story of the gospel in action, changing the world one heart at a time. As we conclude this exploration into the book of Romans, we see how this powerful letter not only transformed the lives of early Christians, but also laid the groundwork for centuries of theological thought and spiritual growth. The message of Romans is more than just a historical artifact. It is a living testament to the enduring power of faith, hope, and love. Paul's words, written in the heart of an empire, continue to resonate today, reminding us of the incredible journey of transformation that begins with faith in Christ. If this exploration has inspired you, I encourage you to delve deeper into the history and impact of the book of Romans and to reflect on its relevance in your own life. Here at Roman Stories, we are committed to bringing you more insights into the stories that have shaped our world, and we invite you to be part of this journey with us. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our channel for more fascinating content. And don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Let's keep the conversation going. And finally, be sure to share this video with your community group, family and friends, so they too can discover the profound legacy of the Book of Romans. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in our next video. In times of theological confusion, it has provided a firm anchor, keeping the church grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This letter has been, and continues to be, a beacon that illuminates the path of faith. Moreover, Romans has played a crucial role in shaping Christian thought on issues such as social justice, morality, and the role of believers in society. Paul's emphasis on love, humility, and civic responsibility has inspired movements of social reform and positive change around the world. The letter to the Romans has not only shaped the church, it has also influenced the very course of Western civilization. The enduring impact of Romans is a testament to the power of God's word. As the church continues to study, preach, and live out the message of this letter, its legacy will only grow. Romans calls us to a living faith, a secure hope, and an active love virtues that, when practiced, have the power to transform lives, communities, and the world. The story of Romans is not just the story of a book. It is the story of the gospel in action, changing the world one heart at a time. As we conclude our journey through the history of the book of Romans, I hope you've gained a deeper understanding of the incredible impact this letter has had on the Christian faith. Paul's words, written nearly two millennia ago, continue to resonate with power and relevance, offering us a blueprint for understanding salvation, grace, and the transformative power of the gospel. The story of Romans is not just a story from the past. It is a living narrative that speaks to our hearts today. It reminds us of the unity we have in Christ the hope we hold in our faith, and the love that we are called to share with the world. Whether you're facing challenges in your walk with God, or seeking to grow deeper in your faith, the Book of Romans offers timeless wisdom and encouragement. If this exploration has inspired you, I encourage you to continue your journey with us here at Bible Stories. Make sure to subscribe to our channel so you won't miss any of our upcoming videos where we dive into the rich and transformative teachings of the Bible. Your subscription helps us reach more people with the life-changing message of God's Word.
And don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Share it with your church group, family, and friends, so they too can be blessed by the powerful truths of Scripture. Finally, leave a comment below to let us know your thoughts. How has the Book of Romans impacted your life? Your stories and insights can encourage others on their faith journey. Thank you for being a part of this community. And remember, the story of God's love is still being written in your life. Let's continue to explore it together. God bless.